Good morning, Spooner Hi, church family. We're excited to touch base with you guys and talk about what God's doing in our lives and our hearts despite all the uncertainty. Um, for me, I'm coming off of a really busy season, and so the slowdown is probably needed, but also really hard. Um, I've been really thinking about um, how I want to get through this time closer to God and closer to my family. And I know, I know that that's happening, even though it feels uncomfortable and challenging a lot of the times. Um, a verse that's really been um, sticking out to me is 1 John 3, 1. It says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's 1 John 3, 1. And what that's been teaching me is that um, with all these new um, patterns and routines and identities that I need to get used to, like homeschooling and being unemployed, um, that the most important identity I can have is being a child of God. And so God's really stretching me and pushing me to embrace that and just know that his love is, is the foundation I need no matter what my circumstances are like. Hey guys, it's Sean Kidder. I just wanted to hop on here and kind of share some of the things that God has been doing in my life. I know these past two weeks have been chaotic and really out of the norm, but I've learned just to see the good in it and just take only the positives away. And some of those positives are the abundance of time I have. So when I'm not doing schoolwork, I just hop in the Word. And I found my devotional time has just increased so much compared to when I was in school. I hop in the Word two to three times a day for a good half hour to an hour each time. So I've really just been getting in the Word, which has been awesome. Other positive things, I've been working on my spike ball game. And truth is, I don't know if Pastor Ron's going to be ready. I don't think he's going to know what hits him once we hop into a game, once all this clears up. Safer at home, eh? Whoever coined that term didn't have seven kids. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we're doing well here at the Hershey residence. Um, being self-employed uh, doesn't allow me to be at home much, so it's been nice to spend a lot of time at home with the family. I think we've had five meals that we all sat down, the whole family, uh, in the last five nights. That's unheard of. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm Riley. And we are thankful for this time of slowing down to have more time with God. We have been reading a story out of our Jesus storybook every single morning. Me and Riley and Emmett sit down and we read a story. So we're starting our day out with God, right? Because we don't have to get up and go places. So we're very thankful for that. I'm also finding more time to sit and read my Bible, as well as to read some books that I've had set aside to read in order to strengthen my walk with God also. So this time has been great for just slowing down and refocusing and helping us to learn that we have absolutely no control of the situation. We have to trust God. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Good morning, church. Join us as the band leads us in worship this morning. If only we could see
just wanted to let you know what God's been doing in my life during these turbulent times. From somebody who suffers from depression and anxiety, this really can send my world into overdrive. Um, it's pretty amazing. My daily devotions for the past couple weeks have pretty much all been on trusting God more and not fearing. And God really knows that I need that daily reminder, especially right now. And um, other things that he's been doing in my life is helping me see the silver linings. Um, recognizing the good in people and, and how people are going out of their way to be kinder and nicer and even more patient with one another. So I hope that this is encouragement to the rest of you. Um, and just God bless and we're going to get through this. One of the things that I've struggled with my entire life is depression. And I know at times like this, you know, when there's crises is taking place, it tends to have a, a negative effect on, on me. It tends to really bring out negative thoughts. And this past week, I really started thinking about all the ways that the things that have been happening might relate to end times prophecies. I began obsessing over all of the political ramifications, and I tend to fall prey to a lot of conspiracy theory type things anyway. And then I started thinking of all the looming financial pressures and the relational pressures that would result. I was dwelling on every negative thing that my brain could possibly conjure up, and I was replaying it all on a continuous loop in my brain. And as oftentimes happens with people who are prone to depression, it's really difficult when you get into a cycle of negativity to find the actual tools inside that you need to break out of that negative thought cycle. And I found myself at the uh, beginning of this week in a very negative thought cycle, and it really more or less disabled me for a couple of days. And I was really having a difficult time finding the tools that I needed to get out of that negative thought cycle. But thankfully, you know, over the last couple of years, God's really been working on me to develop some habits and some strategies in my life that actually help me to break those negative thought cycles. And this past week is, I feel like, had been a real gift from God to help me to practice those um, strategies and those habits that I've been putting into my putting into my life to help me break out of that. And God has just been so so faithful to me, helping me to understand how I function, how I'm supposed to function, and how I malfunction, and, and he's been faithful to show me ways to get out of it. Being in his word is a big one. Surrounding yourself with positive people is a big one. Constantly putting positive things, positive thoughts into my brain, listening to positive podcasts, um, just a whole number of things that I could talk about, but really God has shown his faithfulness to me this past week by just helping me to use those tools and those strategies that he has shown me to help me break out of a cycle of depression.
God is doing in my life. It has been a challenge to not see my students. Um, they are some of my favorite people in my world. But what I have learned over the past two weeks is that God has equipped me with so many things. He's taught me over the last couple of years how to use different types of technology and he has inspired a love of connection and a want to help people. And so while I haven't been able to see most of my students face to face, I've been able to connect with them and I've been able to use my tools that I have learned to um, create different videos for them and kind of reach out to them, them that way. With my coworkers, he has again inspired me to connect. That drive is in me and we have been sharing life and laughter and crying and it has just been so good. And again, I am just so thankful that God started that in me months, weeks, years ago and that he also gave me the tools I could use to make those connections. In this obsession with the things this world says makes us happy Can't see the slaves we are in all the searching, all the grasping As we go to prayer this morning, I'd like to share with you a prayer that was out on version. Some of you I know use that Bible app. And I found this prayer just very meaningful to my own life, and I think you will as well. So let's bow our heads and pray together. God, you alone are worthy of our honor, glory, and praise. 
With you, we can overcome every storm, including this global impact of coronavirus and it's having on our world. Right now, we're asking you to heal those who are sick and protect those who are not. Give our leaders extra wisdom as they navigate this pandemic and economic uncertainty. Strengthen your global church, O oh Father, and reveal to us how we can partner together to reach the needs of those around us. Calm our fears and fill us with your hope, joy, and peace as we continue to trust in you. Use this pandemic, Lord, to pave the way for spiritual renewal. We want your glory, power, and healing to be on display. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name, amen. As far as announcements go, you know that in accord with our state safer at home mandate, uh, we are having no activities on campus at this time, which means no Sunday morning worship, no Wednesday night family activities, and no small groups meeting in person. Although we are exploring and doing some things digitally, uh, we do have the live streaming on Sunday morning, which seems to be working out really well, so glad for that. Also, we offer the sermons in audio format. And then this week, Melissa Smith offered a Wednesday night Kids Alive online version, which went super well, had close to 20 kids participating along with parents and, and some adults. So uh, glad for that, Melissa. Thank you. And we're exploring the possibility of doing more of that sort of thing as the need arises. So stay tuned for that possibility. But the biggest announcement for today is what I have to share with you next. As you know, with the resignation of Pastor Mike a few months ago, we have needed to, to work on a replacement, which I have been doing. In the, in the past few months, I've been prayerfully considering where our church is at and where I believe we're going and what we need as a result to help us get there. Another reality that is factored into this equation are our current financial uh, realities. As you know, our giving has been down some the last couple of months and our expenses up. And so it has become clear as I've been working on the hiring of new staff uh, that at this time we should not hire full-time staff, uh, but look at the possibility of, of part-time. Turns out that very early on in the process, two people trained in ministry, both with degrees in ministry, submitted their resumes as possible candidates to be considered for this staff position. Those two actually come from within our church family, and both are open to a part-time situation. So the long and short of it is, a process of interviews took place, several conversations, several interviews, and earlier this past week, we hired Quentin Mendenhall as a part-time assistant pastor for our church, and we have also hired Morgan Wistad as a part-time intern pastor for our church. The board is really excited about this. I'm really excited, and I'm anxious for you to hear directly from these two to get to know them better as we begin this journey together. So first, I want to introduce you to Quentin Mendenhall, whom, as I just said, uh, has been hired part-time as an assistant pastor. Quentin, it's been so fun getting to know you over the last few months and to welcome you and Rachel back into town and into our church. I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I wondered if in a minute or so you could just help us get to know you, uh, tell us about Rachel, about your coming back to Spooner and what brought you here. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Quentin Mendenhall, and like Pastor Ron said, I am the new uh, part-time adult discipleship pastor at Spooner Wesleyan Church. Um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in central Indiana, similar to Pastor Ron. Um, I grew up in a small farm town, not much bigger than Spooner, not much different than Spooner. Uh, I like to say that Tipton, where I grew up, is Spooner, if you just take away the lakes. Uh, the lake and all of the pine trees, and you double the cornfields. So that's where I grew up, central Indiana, in the middle of cornfields. Um, I studied at Indiana Wesleyan University, where I got my bachelor's degree in Christian ministry. Uh, I was there on day one that we were on campus. I met my wife, Rachel, who at the time was Rachel Temple. Um, and now, since we're married, she's Rachel Mendenhall. We're going on our fifth year of marriage. Um, and we, after graduating, we moved up to the Twin Cities, where I was a youth pastor for two and a half years, and we really loved our church there, uh, really loved the ministry that we had going on there. 
Um, but like I said, about two and a half years in, we felt God calling us uh, to move back here to Spooner to be closer to some family. Um, and for some financial reasons, we just um, knew that God wanted us here. And uh, there's some kind of some cool stories. If you ask me um, about those, I can give you some accounts of how God made it very clear that we were supposed to be here um, and that we had made the right decision. He confirmed that for us. Um, so yeah, Rachel's, uh, most of Rachel's family is here and we're excited to be near them. We're excited to be uh, at Spooner Wesleyan Church where we have been attending since August when we moved back. Quentin, we know that Jesus' last command is our first concern when he says, go therefore and make disciples. At our church, we talk about this in our mission statement as engaging people on the journey with Jesus, which means that we desire to provide people starting points to begin their journey with Jesus and also to help people take their next step on the journey with Jesus. Or to very simply say it, we're all about making disciples who make disciples. Uh, that's our mission, both inside and outside our church. And you're being hired to model that and to help us together be that and do that. I know from conversations that that excites you a great deal, and it's kind of at the core of your passions. So I was wondering if you could just share a bit more with the people. Discipleship is something that uh, I hope doesn't just excite me. I hope it excites everybody in the church. Um, but you, you kind of said it, Pastor Ron, the Great Commission um, to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to teach them to observe the commandments of God. Uh, those were Jesus's, basically his last commands to his disciples. Um, and if we're going to call ourselves disciples even today, we have to be willing to follow those commands. Um, and one of the things I like to point out is in the Great Commission, Jesus doesn't say go and make disciples. Con conversions or go and make converts. He says make disciples. And I think there's a distinction to be made there. Um, we're talking about all in sold out disciples who make disciples at the command, uh, following the command of Jesus. And so uh, through our conversations and the interviewing process and our preliminary conversations, um, you kind of told me that you feel like the church has a good start in this way, um, but definitely some room for growth. And so that's something that I am passionate to see uh, happen, is for the church to grow in this area um, and to grow in true discipleship in making disciples as well. We want to train the disciples of the church to make more disciples. And that's kind of the model Jesus had when the early church started too. He started with his 12 disciples and trained them to make disciples, and they did, and here we are today. Um, so the good news is it's not all that complicated. We kind of overcomplicate the process. Um, all that it really takes is first and foremost a genuine, authentic, caring relationship with a person um, and a commitment to the process of discipleship. And, you know, before all of that, I think a willingness to actually engage and obey the command of Jesus to make disciples and to live the things that he taught to observe his commandments as Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 say. Um, so like I said, good news, it's not as complicated as we make it, but I'm excited to um, model this, model this type of living and to uh, bring the church along. Quentin, there is one concern I have. Uh, you have shared with me that when it comes to football, the NFL, that you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan, not a Green Bay Packer fan. Uh, I realize that we all grow and mature in time, and if people are patient, then eventually we see the light. So I just want to know, I need to have your word, that you are open to seeing the light about the superior NFL football team. You know, I was a little worried uh, that this might come up and that this might be a problem. I will say this was not a part of the interview process, so you're kind of springing this one on me. Um, here's what I can tell you. I love football. Um, I coach football at the middle school here in Spooner, and I coached over in, uh, in Minnesota. So what I will say is this. The Packers are my favorite team in the NFC North, and they're, um, I will cheer and go Pack Go anytime they are not playing the Eagles. Um, you know, I, I became an Eagles fan around the same time I became a Christian, and I don't think that's coincidental. I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, I'm just teasing about that. But um, fly, Eagles, fly, and it'll always be fly, Eagles, fly, unless 
um, the Packers are playing the Eagles, then it's Go Pack Go too. I got no problem with that. Quentin, welcome. Just so glad you're joining the pastoral team here at Spooner Wesleyan. We're all looking forward to getting to know you better and to working and serving alongside of you and with you and under your, your leadership and inspiration. By the way, so that everybody knows, as I already said, we're hiring a Quentin in a part-time position. And given the reality of the, the, the current coronavirus, the lockdown mode that we're in and the uncertainties that we're all facing in this moment, uh, we're going to hire Quentin right away. He'll start working right away in a very part-time situation in terms of hours. But then as the situation improves, our intention is to increase his hours gradually, again part-time, but eventually getting to 20 to 25 hours per week as we're able. Also, as part of our provision for Quentin and for his wife, Rachel, they're going to be moving into the Seton House, the parsonage where Kelly was previously living, and they're going to be making that move in the coming weeks. So again, Quentin, welcome aboard. And uh, if we were meeting you in person in the sanctuary today, people would be clapping right now. But I have an idea that they're clapping in their homes where they are. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to getting the ball rolling here and getting some uh, some ministry rolling. I'm really excited once this um, once this coronavirus um, situation blows over and uh, things start to get back to normal. I cannot wait. Um, thank you so much, and I thank you for the ways that you've already begun welcoming uh, Rachel and I onto, um, into the f church family and welcoming me onto staff. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know the rest of our church family as well, beyond the connections that we already have. Um, so again, thank you so much. We are excited. We cannot wait, and we feel really blessed. second person I'd like to introduce you to today, the second part-time person we're hiring, uh, many of you would know very, very well. But let me introduce you to Morgan Wistad, whom we have just hired as a pastoral intern. Uh, Morgan, and I have known you for a long time. You've been a part of our church family since around 2000, I think. If I recall, you were like 10, 11, 12 years of age. Uh, many folks already know you well, but not everyone. So if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute to also give us a bit of background information about yourself, your family, uh, your call to ministry, your schooling, and where you are right now. Hi, church family. It's excited to be able to join you on this video and just announce this internship that I have been offered here at Spooner Wesleyan Church. This has been really exciting for me because this is my church home. And so to be able to build upon the foundation that I already have and the relationships I already have within this church is a special time for me. I've been coming here for 20 years now and my family had switched churches and become established when I was a teenager. And we have just loved this church every step of the way. My extended family still comes here and um, my immediate family is my husband, Caleb. We've been married for 11 years and our son, Jackson, who is seven years old. So I've been a Christian my whole life, but five or six years ago, something really began to shift within me. I went through a season of struggling, um, just health concerns, different things not going the way that you want to within life. And that period shifted me to understand that I could place my hope and my trust in God and not in my circumstances. And so after, um, after that season was kind of evolving, I suddenly felt a calling to ministry. And this was a total surprise to me. And so I spent six months praying and talking to God about it and trying to rationalize it away because this was not on my radar. This wasn't my plan for life. I currently um, and then worked as a dental hygienist, and so I definitely wasn't in vocational ministry in any way. Um, but I got out of that six-month period of talking with God and just felt like if I did not pursue ministry and what God was calling me towards, that I'd be disobedient to Him. And um, even though it doesn't always make sense, I don't want to be disobedient to God. So two and a half years ago, I went back to school. I did an online program to finish my bachelor's degree in ministry and leadership. And so I just recently completed that. 
and was been praying and talking to a pastor about what's next. And so to get offered this internship is just an exciting opportunity to see where God is calling me towards, to just learn and develop the gifts that he's given me um, to serve him and his people. And Morgan, a similar question as I asked Quentin, our calling as a church is to make disciples who make disciples. So would you please share with the people how that calling and how the way God has wired you, the passion you have for Jesus, fits in with where we need to go? So there was a time where I heard a teaching that talked about the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And I really felt like God made it personal at that time where it was no longer just a teaching of Jesus that I could admire in other people, but it was something I was supposed to live out myself. And so ever since then, I've just been figuring out what that looks like. And I think one of the best ways that we live out discipleship is through relational living, where we are absorbing God's love and then extending it to others. So God has wired me really relationally. I just love people. And so I think that will play well into learning how to, how to develop discipleship within our church. Um, and the big thing that I think everybody should know is that we all have something to offer others. So as long as we are learning and growing in Jesus ourselves, we have something to extend to the people within our lives to have that discipleship be a growing process between all of us. Um, what discipleship really is, is growing closer to Jesus. And so I just, I want to help people see that together we can do that for each other and we can grow ourselves and extend it to others so that we can be multipliers and we can be hope for other people of the hope Jesus has given us. So Morgan, I think you may already be a, a Packer fan, I'm not sure, although I think your mother might be a, a Vikings fan, but we won't get into that. But when it comes to taking off some time just to relax, to do things that fill you up, I know your husband, Caleb, loves hunting and fishing, but what is it for you? Well, it feels like a big win to already be a Packer fan. So as far as hobbies go, um, my main hobby if you can call it one, is to sit at a coffee shop. So anybody who knows me knows that I really enjoy that. Um, otherwise, in the winter, our family enjoys a lot of skiing and snowboarding. It was fun to teach Jackson this year and really enjoy that together. In the summer, we like camping, we like being at the cabin, and just really anything that brings the people I love together. So once again, welcome, Morgan. So glad you're joining the pastoral team as a part-time intern. In case anybody is not familiar with that term, a pastoral intern is someone who's received training in ministry but hasn't yet had too much opportunity to practice, to have too much experience, although Morgan has been very involved as a layperson over the years. But this internship provides practical experience along with the schooling that Morgan has received and to further develop her giftings, as well as to discover the specific ways that God has shaped her, both for now and the future. So Morgan is on board for a two-year stint, a two-year internship, and then who knows how the Lord may lead from there. Again, while we're in lockdown mode, the hours will be relatively few in, in the starting out zone, but as the situation normalizes, improves, uh, Morgan's part-time position will, a few more hours will be added. So once again, Morgan, welcome, and if we were here in person this morning, the people would be clapping for you, but let's all welcome her on board from home. Thank you, Pastor Ron, and just really excited to get to know you all better. At this time, while the band continues to lead us in singing, I invite you to participate in worship through giving. There will be a slide on your screen giving you directions for giving, whether that be online or if you choose to give via check, via the mail. All of that information will be there before you. So we're going to pray, and then we'll continue to worship in our singing and in our giving. Let's pray together. Father, it's so good to be gathered this morning, not together in person, but together in spirit. So as we worship you in our giving, it's not reluctantly but just so grateful that you've made it possible for us to give. 
We know that everything we have is because of your generosity and your grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning. With a love that casts out fear. in the planning phase of this series we're doing during this Easter season leading up to Easter Sunday called The Journey, where we're tracing the footsteps of Jesus during his earthly life. 
If you've been with us throughout this series, you know that we moved from that early moment on the Jordan River when uh, his cousin John the Baptist baptized him, then on to Capernaum and also Nazareth where Jesus announced the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news, including the good news of healing for the sick and the oppressed, then to the mountain where Jesus taught an ethic of how life is to get lived in the kingdom of God, on to the Sea of Galilee last Sunday where the authoritative uh, word of Christ calmed the storm and, and the disciples says, who is this man? And now today we meet up with Jesus in Samaria and our Lord has this transforming moment, this transforming interchange with the woman at the well. As I've been contemplating this message and what I feel I'm to share with you this morning, it shouldn't surprise you that I'm looking at life through the lens of the coronavirus, which is probably the same lens through which you look these days. I mean, COVID-19 is a very uh, sobering kind of reality that, that we're all experiencing and wondering what it all means. I think you'd agree with me that our lives have been radically interrupted starting about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And the lifestyles to which we had grown accustomed, that which we considered to be normal, came screeching to a halt. And nowadays we're living a very altered reality of the way things used to be. Uh, for example, our ability to, to move around and go where we want to go, our freedom of mobility is definitely cramped by the Wisconsin State Safer at Home mandate. And it's so very important that we follow that mandate, but it's not fun. Or the value of our mutual funds, if we were fortunate enough to have one, has been greatly diminished in just a couple of weeks. Or even our jobs, the opportunity to go to work every day and uh, to produce income for ourselves and our family, even that is at risk. A number of us have been furloughed, laid off as businesses go dark for a period of time or even permanently close their doors. But I suppose what is scariest of all is that as of Friday this past week, March the 27th, the, date would, the, the number would be even higher now. But as of Friday, there were over 900 cases of coronavirus reported here in the state of Wisconsin alone, along with 15 who have passed away. In the United States, 100,000 cases, over 1,500 dead. And in the world, nearly 600,000 confirmed cases with 27,000 people dead. Again, those numbers are not up to date because every day, hour by hour, day by day, the numbers continue to climb, and those are just the people that we're able to count. So what is the impact of that? How is that affecting us personally? Some people seem not to be affected much at all, although I can't help but wonder if they may be hiding it or faking it. But I wonder if, if for you, for me this morning, if it's really not getting us to thinking about what lasts or what doesn't last in life, of what matters or what doesn't matter in life, of what life is all about. And certainly we all have been reminded of the universality of our mortality. Perhaps you find yourself this morning no longer focusing just on the, the next thing you have to do or the next uh, thing you want to acquire or the next pleasure you want to enjoy. But somehow in the sanctuary of our minds and our hearts, perhaps for the very first time, uh, we find ourselves beginning to reckon with questions of, of, of the realities of the ultimate and of the eternal. Uh, this current pandemic is, is, is serious. And we're beginning to realize just how serious it truly is. And as it gets closer to home, particularly if or when it touches the life of a loved one, God forbid, someone we deeply love, it's very much a wake-up call. And so, if nothing else, the coronavirus offers us the opportunity of assessment and of reassessment. It's almost like we have this worldwide time out, this, this gift almost to step back and slow down and assess our lives and and see if the way we've been living our lives this past year or five years or 50 years is what we want it to be. If we are living the way we were meant to live. In that sense, COVID-19 is a gift to us. And so I'm inviting us this morning, friends, to receive it and treat it like a gift, to evaluate priorities, to assess trajectories, even the ultimate destination of our lives. That is my invitation to you today. There's a story in the Bible, the New Testament, book of John, 
We read that one day when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, let me stop there and say the Pharisees were, were a devoutly religious group back in Jesus' day, uh, very strict, very religious, very much about keeping the rules. And they loved to count and to compare and to see who was making the grade and who was not religiously and morally speaking. And so there was this time when they noticed that Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more converts than John and his disciples. It was like a competition to them. Of course, churches in our day never count and never compare, do we? But I digress. But we read, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making more disciples and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea. Now, Judea would be the center of Judaism, and, and Jerusalem would be the capital there. But Jesus got out of Dodge. He doesn't want anything to do with spiritual competition with his cousin John, and he departed for Galilee. And then we read, he had to pass through Samaria. Quick geography lesson. When the Bible says Jesus had to pass through Samaria, you need to understand that the Judea was way down south and, and Galilee was way up north and everybody knows the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And, and so to get from Judea to the south up to Galilee up north, the fastest way to get there would be right through Samaria, which geographically stood somewhere in the middle. So one way of interpreting that phrase, he had to pass through Samaria, is that the most efficient way for Jesus and his disciples to get to where they needed to go was to pass through Samaria. Except that's not what the scripture is saying. For you understand, there was another way to get from Judea up to Galilee. Many Jews of that day, especially the religious ones, would take a circuitous route. They did a, a sort of walk around. It was more miles, more time, but very much worth it to them just to avoid Samaria and the Samaritans. You need to understand, back in those days, Jews absolutely hated the Samaritans. It's kind of like Packer fans hate you-know-who. Except that's really not true. I mean, we say we hate the Vikings and the Vikings hate us or the Packers and the Bears, but it's all in fun. But you need to understand there was this deep, not fun, very real hatred between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people because the Jews perceived the folk of Samaria as half-breeds. Hundreds of years before, the nation of Syria attacked the ten northern tribes of Israel, and they infiltrated that area. They basically carted off the Jews and imported Assyrian Gentiles, and as a result, they began to intermarry and mix religions and even built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which is why the Jews were so deeply prejudiced against the people of Samaria, calling them half-breeds. Think about some of the names we call people today. Uh, prejudice runs very deep even to this moment. It's a real ugly deal. And so many Jews, the religious ones at least, would travel north and they would avoid Samaria at all costs. They would do the walk around, but not our Lord Jesus. Our scripture today says he had to pass through Samaria. Question, why does it say that? Why did Jesus half to walk through, to pass through Samaria. Hold that thought. We'll get back to it in a minute. Reading on, verse 5, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And what I see in those verses is the introduction of a universal human need. A universal human need. You see, every one of us has to have water. No one can live long without water. I read just the other day that uh, much more than, than three days without water and you're a goner. Uh, you can live many, many days without food, but not water. Even Jesus, our Lord, in his humanity, has to have water. So imagine the scene. It's straight up noon. 
Middle Eastern sun is unmercifully beating down. Jesus arrives at Sychar after what I presume to be a long walk, a long journey. He's bone tired, he's dead weary, and the first thing he wants is, is water. So he sits down at Jacob's well with this long history of significance. Jacob was the, the grandson of Abraham, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had purchased this well with 100 pieces of silver and eventually gave it as a gift to his son Joseph. So Jesus sits down at the well. Before long, this Samaritan woman from Sychar shows up at that same well. By the way, it's rather odd that she should appear at that time of day and all alone. Because usually women would come together either early in the morning or later in the evening when it was cooler and it was a sort of daily, daily ritual. But this woman comes midday as though she is purposely trying to avoid a social gathering. She comes to draw water, and it's at that point Jesus reveals his basic need. Our Lord is the first one to make himself vulnerable, and he makes the request, give me a drink. Verse 9, the woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You notice the woman is quickly putting up her guard. She doesn't trust Jesus, a Jew. And so she's quite defensive, understandably so, with this long history of prejudice that we talked about. It occurs to me, the culture of America today that we live in, the power of prejudice in our country right now, the walls of hatred and, and distrust that so deeply divide us, whether politically or, or ethnically or economically or spiritually, we have our walls as well. And it's amazing to me that even in the midst of this coronavirus, that, that it, it appears to me the walls that divide us are sometimes even greater than that which would bring us together. Although I do notice as the pandemic is breaking out all over the world and more and more people are sick and dying, you see COVID-19 is no respecter of race or color or creed. So doesn't it make sense, at least one would hope, that we might come together and pull together, even if but momentarily, for the common good in the midst of this vulnerability that we all share and feel? Jesus needs water. He comes to Jacob's well. This woman needs water. She comes to Jacob's well. They meet together in that shared moment and with that shared need. But the hatreds and the hostilities of the past continue to rear their ugly head. But Jesus will not be deterred. He has to go through Samaria. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And you notice at this point the verbal interchange that our, our Lord suddenly switches the focus of the discussion. He will not be drawn into a dispute about the historical or ethnic differences they may have. But rather he redirects the discussion by degree to another sort of water, to another sort of universal need, what he calls living water. And living water, it seems to me, is just as necessary, just as non-negotiable for humankind as physical water. For even as folk cannot survive long without H2O, neither can folk live, at least not live well, nor live in eternity without living water. You say, Pastor Ron, wait a minute, do you really believe that? <laughs> How do you know that? How can you say that? Here is what I know. And what I have observed of myself and of others. That just as there is a universal quest for water to quench physical thirst. Just so, and you can call it whatever you will, it goes by different names. Sometimes people talk about the need for fulfillment. Or the need for satisfaction or purpose or meaning in life or peace or the need to be enough. However you would describe that, there is this universal quest, this thirsting, this longing, this, this panting for whatever it is or whoever it is. Jesus calls it living water. So it seems to me no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, we're all on this quest, we're all on this search. 
And until we can find it, whatever it is, until we find the it, we are empty and we are not okay. Often people search for a very, very long time and sometimes people never find it. In 2016, Charlotte Getz wrote these words, when, when will enough be enough? Before announcing the nominees for Best Motion Picture and Comedy, comedian Jim Carrey said to Hollywood's elite who were gathered for the Golden Globe ceremony, Carrey said, I am a two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. You know when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just the guy going to sleep. I am a two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey, going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No siree, I dream about being the three-time Golden Globe winning actor, Jim Carrey. Because then, I would be enough. It would finally be true, and I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately will not fulfill me. And the actors that evening, dressed to perfection in their designer gowns and their tuxedos, doubled over in laughter. And yet, as the camera panned their faces, it seemed as though his words rang truer than any of Hollywood's elite were comfortable admitting. Getz concludes, if a Golden Globe or three will not satisfy, what will? Philip Yancey writes in Christianity Today an encouraging truth he heard from a young man named Mike. Uh, Mike worked among the homeless folk. Yancey writes that Mike told me that homeless people, having hit bottom, don't waste their time building up an image or trying to conform. Rather, they pray without pretense, a refreshing contrast to what we often find in churches. So Yancey asked Mike for an example. Mike said, my friend and I one day were playing guitars and singing the song as the deer panteth for the water, and, and David, a homeless man there that day, started to weep. David said, that's what I want, man. That's what I want. I want water. I'm an alcoholic, and I want to be healed. So it seems like no matter who you are, whether you're an up-and-outer or a down-and-outer, it's all the same. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. But we have our deflections and our defenses, how that cannot be true. And as to why the universal solution to our universal thirst could not possibly be Jesus. So the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well. He drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. You see, this woman, this Samaritan lady, is giving reasons why Jesus cannot possibly be the one to ask and why Jesus cannot possibly be the one to offer living water. It's as though she's saying, you can't be all that now, can you? But Christ continues to offer, and he continues to press in. He had to go through Samaria. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now here is what I see as the story gradually unfolds. Please don't miss it. You see, dear friend, when it comes to receiving living water, for this living water to truly become our own, there are two things that have to happen. First of all, we have to see Jesus as he is and for who he is. And sometimes that takes time. We don't immediately get a clear picture of him. We don't generally embrace a full revelation of Jesus Christ. It comes gradually. It comes in stages. But over time, if we are open... We come to see him as he truly is. And then second, we must come to see ourselves as we are. Uh, to see me as I am, with no smoke screens and no self-delusions, just the naked truth, the honest truth about me. You see, we have to be honest about Jesus, 
And we have to be honest about ourselves. Now notice how that unpacks for this Samaritan woman. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have, that is the one you are now living with, is not your husband. What you have said is true. Jesus is inviting this woman to be honest about herself, uh, to call a spade a spade, to embrace her own relational bankruptcy and brokenness in life. She knows it's true, and it's amazing to her the knowledge that he has of her, which helps her to get a, gain a, a greater grasp of the knowledge of him. And so the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Notice she's getting hotter. She's getting closer to the reality of Jesus. And then jumping down to verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now she's really hot, getting really close to the truth of Jesus. At which point, Jesus makes the climactic self-disclosure of 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. What a great statement. I who speak to you am he. Verse 28, so the woman left her water jar, went away to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ. You know, I have a feeling that a number of us who are part of this live stream or listening online, uh, we try to present this beautiful facade of who we are to others. We try to keep parts of ourselves hidden and that somehow in our hiddenness, we desperately want to keep to remain okay. But deep down inside, we know. We all know, don't we? Jennifer Lawrence, famous for her role in the Hunger Games, had a, has had a long battle with anxiety and insecurity. And in a 2014 interview, she talks about this very thing. And that even in her worst moments, she is certain that her career will come crashing down. She said, people are going to get sick of me. I'm way too annoying. But if people want to start a backlash against me, I will become the captain of that team because as much as you may hate me, I am 10 steps ahead of you. So I wonder, are you watching? Are you listening today? And you're going, you know, pastor, that's me. That's me. I know about me. I try to hide me, but I, but I know me. And if other people really get to know me. But listen, here's the thing. Jesus does know you. Jesus already knows you. He knows all about you from the inside out. Like the Samaritan woman said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. But herein you see lies the hope, the good news of the gospel. That it's in the intersection of total honesty, total honesty about ourselves and total honesty about Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the giver of life-giving water, that our thirst is quenched and our souls are satisfied. Which brings me to the climax of the story, verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. I don't know if you're familiar with the name Malcolm Muggeridge. Some of you probably are. But Thomas Malcolm Muggeridge was actually born in Great Britain back in 1903, died in 1990, a British journalist and satirist, very interesting guy. Early on in his life, his 20s, he was attracted to communism and actually went to live in the Soviet Union for a period of time, but came back realizing he didn't like it. During World War II, Muggeridge worked for the British governor as a spy and a soldier. But then in the aftermath of the war, he became a famous London journalist 
And during that same time, he came under the influence of a Christ follower, and Muggeridge gave his life to Christ. He converted to Christianity. As I was getting ready for this talk, I read a quote by Malcolm Muggeridge that summarizes everything I've been trying to say. Let me share it with you. Muggeridge says, I I may, I suppose, regard myself or pass for being a relatively successful man. People sometimes stare at me in the streets, and that's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the Internal Revenue Service. That's success. And furnished with money and a bit of fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may partake of trendy diversions, which is pleasure. It might happen that once in a while something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact upon our time, and that would be fulfillment. Yet, I say to you, and I beg of you to hear me and believe me, multiply those tiny triumphs by a million, add them all together, and they are nothing, they are less than nothing, a positive impediment measured against one draft of that living water that Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. Do you hear what Muggeridge is saying? Super successful guy, great fame, great success, enjoyed immense pleasure, experienced fulfillment in his job. And yet in the end, he says, take it together, multiply it by one million, and it's nothing, nothing in comparison to one long, cool drink of the living water through relationship with Jesus Christ. So perhaps you're listening, watching this morning, and In this time in which we live, the coronavirus and all of its ramifications, you're starting to see life in a different way and even to see yourself in a different way. You know it's time to make some changes. You've heard my message, but more than that, perhaps you've sensed God speaking to you and nudging you, even inviting you to to take a drink. Jesus, you see, had to go through Samaria for love's sake. And Jesus has shown up at your house this morning for love's sake. And if you sense that he's nudging you today, urging you to stop the endless pursuit of that which will never satisfy and to receive through Christ that living water, please don't squander the opportunity. Around the turn of this century, around the year 2000, Daryl Strawberry, a a really good baseball player, could have been a great baseball player, but he got involved in drugs. And as a result, Strawberry got in trouble with the law, and at his hearing, he explained to the judge why it was that he used drugs. You know what he said? Daryl Strawberry said, life has not been worth living for me. That is the honest truth. Life has not been worth living for me. That is the honest truth. And perhaps this morning, if you're really honest with yourself, you wouldn't say it out loud, but if you're really honest, you find yourself saying, Pastor Ron, and life has not been worth living for me either. If so, I just want you to know, it doesn't have to stay that way. We have this universal need. We all do. We're all thirsty. But there is a Savior who has come offering the universal solution. Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So that's the invitation. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you have spoken through your word and through your spirit. And for that one person or persons who has heard that word today and know that what we've been talking about is just for him or her, I want to pray this prayer on their behalf. Father, I'm thirsty. I need you. I may not know much about you or what it means to follow you, but I invite you into my life. I want that living water. Make yourself real to me, dear God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I just want you to know God heard that prayer. 
And I would encourage you to share what has happened to you with someone you trust, maybe a Christian friend. Talk to your pastor. Get in touch with me. My contact information is on our web page. I'd be happy to talk. But in the meantime now, let's all stay connected uh, to the end of the service as the band leads us in this final song.
thank you so much for joining us in our worship. So glad that you tuned into the live stream or a part of the audio broadcast. I hope you found today's uh, service just encouraging and helpful to your spiritual walk with God. As I mentioned at the middle of the worship time, if you want to give, you can give online and do that through the Facebook page or through our web, or you can also give via check by mail. So let me leave you now with Jesus' invitation, his offer of, of salvation and life to those who believe. He says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Go in peace.